everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from IrishSportsDaily.com. I am your host, Greg Flamong, and with me, as always, is Jamie Uyama, Mr. Jamie University. It is Thursday, April 11th, and we've got another mailbag show from Irish Sports Daily customers. They gave us a ton of good questions, and we are going to provide the answers, our insights, our um, prognostications on uh, some of the things that people had for us. So uh, that's going to be the show. It's going to focus mainly on spring practice. Of course, Oscar Vamos Irish. He he gave us a uh, he gave us a question that's uh, you know a little bit out there, but that's that's why we love Oscar, and that's why he's. I thought a major it was great. Part of our show. Yeah. Jamie loves it. Jamie loves the question. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please uh, subscribe to our channel. It would really help us out. We'd really appreciate that. Please like this video. Please hit the notification bell so you know whatever it is. We are going live. Links to the podcast are in the description below. Rajon hustled over here. Uh, I believe he was out. He was not in the last show. Uh, so we appreciate his attendance today. Uh, Robert Halleck is here. Hit and hustle. Uh Jason sending uh, greetings and salutations to Rajon. We, we love, love to see that. As always, this show is brought to you by ESQ Clothing, which is founded by Notre Dame alum, Ga Wang. You've seen ESQ on all your favorite Notre Dame players and coaches. With over a decade of making the best custom clothing available, ESQ will help you look and feel your best in 2024. From a perfect fitting suit or sport coat, uh, shirt or bomber jacket or that perfect tuxedo for wedding season check out guys amazing work at esqclothing.com book an appointment to upgrade your wardrobe today mention isd and get 10 percent off your entire purchase uh jamie it's thursday so you know what that means six thoughts on thursday came out today jamie why don't you give people a little bit of a preview about what you wrote uh for everyone it's a free article on irisportsdaily.com well what does everyone have in store for them uh well i wrote about the the offense in terms of um i think it's kind of impossible to kind of set expectations for the offense when you think about um you know they're missing a lot of key pieces um you know i i think with the defense you could say oh well ben morrison uh you know he's not out for the string but one you already know what kind of player Ben Morrison is. Yeah. And two, he's really the only guy who's a key guy um, that has been missing for most of spring. Like, you know, I mean, you could say some other guys could help that are injured that are come back later, but not, there's nothing, you know, set in stone with them where, and obviously, you know, you can add Rod Hurd uh, there, mm. but with the offense, it's like, obviously Riley Leonard uh, has not been full go. Uh, for the majority of spring, um, Jane Greathouse is really the only receiver who from last year who was like involved last year that has been there and healthy throughout the whole spring. Uh, because you know, there's like, like a Dion Colsey's been hurt, uh, yeah, Jane Thomas been banged up. Yeah. You're missing Jordan Faison, who's obviously uh, been playing uh, lacrosse this whole time. Bo Collins isn't there. Um, you know, so that's, you know, there's that. And then obviously you're missing two tight ends, you know, led by Mitchell Evans, who is, you know, arguably the top returning tight end in college football, right? So it's kind of hard to kind of look your best and kind of set the expectation for what they can be without that group. So I wrote about that. I wrote about, um, you know, uh, kind of like Notre Dame being a nickel team and kind of, uh, not really to s expect too much Rover. I think it's just one of those things, even though that Notre Dame, uh, we like the talent at linebacker, but it's just based on kind of what team they are and how they have to match personnel. You, yeah, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect to see a lot of three linebackers on the field. Uh, I wrote about, I mean, I want to see more of the, um, the defensive tackles, uh, like the young defensive tackles, because I haven't heard a lot about them and I want to see, more of them hopefully in the next couple of days here um and just about uh, jd bertrand uh i i think some of the stuff that like uh jalen sneed and, and drake bowen in particular and, and anyone who's really said anything about uh jd bertrand just yeah what they've said about him uh as kind of like a leader um in addition as a to as a player and kind of how he's like set the example for these young linebackers um 
you know, that's just like kind of inv invaluable. And one of those things is like he led the team in, in tackles for three straight seasons, you know, not a long list of guys um, that have done that, you know, obviously Manti Tails, the last guy before him to do that. So um, pretty good company that he's in, but, you know, far more than that, he's kind of laid a, a, a foundation for the rest of the linebacker room, which is uh, really cool and, and uh, hopefully appreciated by uh, Notre Dame fans all around. Sounds awesome, Jamie. Everyone check it out on irissportsdaily.com. Uh, we we're going to have a question about nickel, so that that uh, that kind of works out really well because someone's going to ask about uh, – there's a question in here about what Notre Dame looks for in their prototypical nickel player. And uh, – and I've got a, I've got a prediction for you. You don't know we don't know what to expect out of the offense, and I think that's true in terms of what we're going to get from uh, each person or how it's actually going to look on a game to game basis. Who are going to be the key players? It's just kind of hard to predict that. Um, obviously, you know, like we know about uh, Jadarian Price, we know about Jeremiah Love. I think that um, you know Drayden Greyhouse is going to be uh, heavily involved, right? But Mitchell Evans, like the injury and everything, and Eli Raritan's not participating. So that's that's a good point by you. I'm going to make a prediction and say that I think – so the, the the modern, I guess, high mark for yards per play in a season uh, is 702, 7.02 yards. Uh, and that was set by the 2015 team. I'm going to predict this team surpasses that. That's my prediction. Wow. I think they have, okay. I think they have too many. I think they have too many explosive players. I think that I think that uh, the yards per carry for Price and Love is going to be monstrous. It's going to be very high. And I think the Riley Leonard thing. I, I think he's going to be a uh, such a weapon. He is. Just, I think they're going to get their yards in chunks this year. That's how it's going to be. And so that's that's kind of my prediction. So. That's why uh, I'm not, not even a hot take, uh, hot take Thursday here. And Greg's thrown that out, but I, I will say though that, um, I, I thought I was like, oh man, that's a pretty bold prediction. And then I just remembered that, uh, Notre Dame averaged 6.95 yards per play last year, which, last year. you know, and I would say, I think that number would kind of shock some people, um, you know, to, to know that that's where they finished. So they finished ninth in the country. The stats, York, right? the stats offensively are just in complete um, conflict with everyone's idea of Notre Dame's offense last year. Completely. They were off the 39 points a game. They were top 10 in the nation. It, it's just like there, there are so many metrics by which the offense was so much better than people – uh, kind of view it because of the way that they played in the losses, right? So I get it. I I'm not saying everyone's kind of and dumb. how they performed. They 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 smoked bad defenses, right? Exactly, right? You get. You, I mean, they destroyed Pitt. They destroyed Wake, right? Um, and obviously, you know, they had they had good numbers against Ohio State, but they didn't score the points. So, yeah. uh, so I get it. I, I'm not saying everyone's wrong to feel that way. It's just like when you look back, when people look back like ten years from now, they're gonna be like, man. That 23 team was amazing <laughs> offensively, and uh, that just wasn't really the case. So, all right, let's uh, let's get into the questions here. Oh, First oh, wait, one. Just one, one oh. quick thing, because Rajon just asked uh, about uh, Jaden Thomas. Oh. Yeah, so just to clarify, yeah, he, he's just I, – I don't we don't know specifically what's the other thing. Like, he's in full pads. He's out there. I mean, he's still doing stuff. He's not off to the side working with things. But, you know, when they went with – like the ones on Tuesday, he didn't go out. Like he didn't go, he didn't go out with, with team stuff. Right. So, uh, and then uh, I had heard that in the scrimmage, I don't, I don't even know if he participated at all. Like they, they had a little bit of a scrimmage um, last Saturday and, and I'm not sure. So I, I think, I don't think it's anything uh, serious. I just think it's, you know, obviously he wouldn't be in pads. Right. If, uh, if they thought it was like he's not in the pit, like he's not, yeah, he's not in the pit. injured guy stuff. Yeah, but he's not. And you know what? With with last year, with what happened, and if you look at it too, because he had a hamstring uh, at the beginning of the 2022 season as mm -hmm. well. That because he was 
um, you know, having a really great camp. And then all of a sudden, right towards the end, he had a hamstring and then um, kind of took him a while to get back before he was full go there. So, I mean, you got to be careful with that because um, obviously you look where the offense was without him and it's uh, it, it hurt. So um, no point in pushing it in the spring. I think they clearly have a plan for a lot of these guys, right? Yeah. Like Eli Rarity. Is it like what is he hurt? Like I no one really knows. He's not really participating. I think I think Jaden Thomas is kind of on the same plan. Like not hurt, maybe not hundred percent healthy, but like if this was the season, they would be ramping up and probably playing. Yeah. They're not right now. And it's fine. Right. It is what it is. Uh so that's the situation there. All right. First question from uh JW Black. How much let me see. If I get up. How much of the normal playbook play calls are the defense and offense able to execute in seven on seven? Ergo, will the defense uh, simulate any blitzes? Main question is whether seven on seven enables learning the playbook close to the level of 11 on 11. And I think this question uh, comes because we found out that uh, from Gina Gaduli that Riley Leonard is doing seven on seven. So he wants to know, or, or they, he or she, uh, wants to know. Um, how much can Riley Leonard pick up from the playbook just doing seven on seven, some of the past concepts um, and things of that nature. So what, what do you think about this one, Jamie? Um, well, I, I mean, I guess some people don't know what seven on seven is. Like, I, right. So I, there's no lie. Right. So, I mean, simulate blitzes. No. Cause that's the whole point is that there's not like pressure. They might, if there's uh, a coverage that calls for someone to blitz with it, that guy might just step up and not be part of the coverage package. They might do that, but that's not, that guy's not rushing at the quarterback with, with no protection in front of him, Right. So that's not, uh, that's not how it works. Right. So yeah, there is no like kind of uh, simulated blitzes in terms of like actual pressure. No. Um but I mean, there's like a clock, like, you know, they, they don't do like an actual clock, like some of these, when you're playing these seven on seven games and, and a lot of it too, is they call it seven on seven, but it's like really like, um, Skelly, right. Or, or skeleton, right. they call it. Right. So it's cause it's not like they're out there. They're not always putting every receiver cause they have to, in the way that they simulate it, they're not putting, if you're doing like regular seven on seven, there's more receivers than you would put um uh, in an actual game what the play is but they're in, in skelly you're using like if it's 11 personnel you have the tight end you have the three receivers you have um the back and those are it they're not adding in an extra um receiver so you're running your plays you're running your playbook so in that sense you are doing your normal play calls it's just that you aren't doing it with pressure. You, you know, he doesn't have to try to avoid a sack. He, you know, he doesn't have to deal with the pressure that's in his face, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, so you're going through the same kind of process uh, in terms of like uh, reading coverages, going through progressions, yeah. you know, trying to fit the ball into tight windows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's like a different view. It's like, uh, I, I don't even know. It's, it would be like, you know, when you're, uh, shooting around in, uh, basketball, um, or like doing a drill in basketball, but it's like, it's not, it's like a half court drill or whatever a half court three on three. It's different than having the whole picture. Right. Or, yeah. um, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're doing a shooting drill without a defender in your face that's the way to kind of look at it. Uh, I think it's, it's super important that he's doing it though. Cause it's like, yeah, you learn the concepts. You want to get all of these, um, you know, you, you want to get down the playbook. And I, I think actually, if you look at what Riley Leonard probably needs the most, it's like just those concepts and getting comfortable um, with everything and seeing coverages and reading um, things and, and, and getting, chemistry with the receivers and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's what matters. Yeah. And so the way that we used to uh, handle blitzes and things of that nature, because like 
you do have to work on your coverage in a when you blitz, right? Like there's things going yeah. on in the back. So what we would do is we would send if it was a linebacker, let's say you send a linebacker as soon as they get up there, they take a knee, right? It's like you're out of the play now. To 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 Jamie's point, like you don't have forever. What our coaches would do is they would just kind of like eye test, like they know what the read is supposed to be and they know how much time they're supposed to. So like you're not working on um, like scramble drill, really, unless unless it's like definitely like there's a scramble drill period and then that's different. But generally in seven on seven, it's like you know how much time it's supposed to take. You know how much this if it takes too long, they'll just blow the whistle and plays over. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, it's like if so the offense, if they're working on hot, then you need to you need to get the ball out to your hot read. And then, the you know, that goes on. If you try to, like, read it out and that sort of thing, you're getting blown up. Right. So they'll yeah. blow the whistle. They'll call it there. So you will work on your blitzes. But um, I think to Jamie's point, when, when you're in seven on seven, I th- you're working on all of your past game concepts. Right. And sometimes the, they'll tell the defense, like, hey, we want you in three cover. We want you in. Uh, man under we want you in uh, too deep we want you in spy coverage like or and sometimes they just say hey the quarterback needs to be able to read this out right but to Jamie's point like you're working on all of the all the timing aspects of it you're working on uh, you know the chemistry with the wide receivers the wide receivers are working on their timing with how to get in and out of routes so seven on seven in the spring and and especially in install is very important Uh, it's very important in the spring it's very important in the fall camp um, once the season comes, you know, then it's like, it's very much less like all of that stuff, team, uh, seven on seven, like one-on-ones, like everything is scaled down in season because you're working more on install and specific concepts for the defense. Um, so yeah, so right now, so the fact that Ryder Leonard is able to do it, it's, it's a very big deal in my opinion in terms of getting him up to speed with the offense uh, and, uh, you know, get building chemistry within his wide receiver group. Uh, Charlie's Armory asks, how much better do you think USC's D will be with the guy from UCLA? Uh, so uh, b- a lot of big changes on uh, for USC uh, defensively. They basically turned over their whole staff. Uh, it, it's kind of a, it, it's kind of an all-star cast of, of people on the defensive side for USC, a lot of fits that it, it you got, you know, you've got the, uh, you've got the defensive coordinator from UCLA. You have a, a linebacker coach who was the head coach. And I believe it was North Dakota state who was kind of like a legend over there uh, or South Dakota. What would one of I, those was, I think it was, uh, North, I, mm, hold on a second. Um, it was North Dakota state, yeah. North Dakota state. Yeah. So he, he was, Legendary coach over there, right? Like very, very good uh, reputation and good, uh, good program. Uh, he comes over, right? There was a defensive coordinator uh, from from uh, Houston, who he is now the defensive backs coach, right? So there's a lot of guys who, if any of them were the actual defensive coordinator, you would say it makes sense, right? And yeah. some of them are in different roles. Um, so that situation, Jamie, what is your read on that? Uh, and how much do you think? The fact that no matter what happens, it's Riley, uh, it's it's uh, Lincoln Riley's program, and they've never had like a great defense ever, you know. Yeah. And there's something to be said about you know maybe it's his process that's causing the problem there. So what, what's your read there? Um, I think yeah, like uh, in terms of like what you said, all star staff. Like Doug Belk is the guy who was the secondary coach from from Houston, and I think if people remember. He was a guy whose name was thrown out for Notre Dame's defensive coordinator job when uh, Al Golden got it. Right. So yeah. he just to kind of give you like the status of kind of where um, he's at. And Matt Entz is the is the guy from uh, North Dakota State. Eric, they also brought in Eric Henderson from um, the Los Angeles Rams to kind of be another defensive uh, to be the defensive line coach. But he's also like co-DC run game coordinator. And then Sean Nua, who was their defensive line coach and was the defensive line coach at Michigan when like Hutchinson was there and all those guys were there. He's like now the 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 defensive end coach. And Danton Lynn is the guy from from UCLA who uh and he's Anthony Lynn's son, uh another Nepo baby. But it, I mean let's face it, there's some of these Nepo babies know how to coach because they've been around the game for so sure. Much. But and so um 
he's and he's from the Baltimore Ravens uh, and he did an outstanding job like UCLA for those who don't know like UCLA's defense was fantastic last year like they they went from garbage to like good, really good and yeah. uh, one of the best in the Pac-12 so I see zero chance that they're not better like they're going to be better like they're just the staff is so much better like they uh, just overall they just have better coaches around so um i think that's probably not good for notre dame from that perspective we're like i mean they're gonna very least be competent you know um mm. and you know can you go from like dead like one of the worst in the country not dead last but close to dead last to really good um i think that's tough but can they go to you know really bad to above average. I think that's very possible. And they, they still have some other personnel stuff that they've got to deal with too. And like, who knows what's going on with Barry Alexander and whether or not he's going to actually bolt or not, you know, he says he's staying, but I mean, those rumors didn't come out of nowhere. Right. So, yeah. um, but I, I would say count on them being better. Uh, but I wouldn't put them in like the, Oh, they're all of a sudden now, now, now UCLA is bringing a defense, like in terms of like one that's going to really scare you because one, that's a big jump to make to go from that to they still got a lot of personnel issues that I think are, you know, and especially depth, right? Because they just haven't recruited well enough. And, and in the, the portal, they, they've added good players, uh, but, you know, you know that it's always going to be – sometimes you're going to get hits, sometimes you're going to get misses. You never hit on everybody. So – and and I do think in the long term, I would be shocked if all those guys are there the next year. Like I, mm -hmm. I think if you look at 2025, would it surprise me if like at least two of those guys were off somewhere else? No, right? I just think that's – there's a very much – uh, especially if you guys don't have previous relationships, it can get really dicey, right? And um, Henderson and Lynn have a relationship, but none of the other guys do. So they're all kind of coming together. So it's like, think about when Harbaugh, he had one year at, at Michigan where he brought in Pep Hamilton. And mm -hmm. then they had... Um, Gosh, I can't remember who the other guy uh, the other guy was, but but I think they also had like Tim Drevno, who was um, the the OC calling plays, and he was the O line coach. And then there was Harbaugh, and then there was somebody else too that was like in there too, who was like all, and it was like, yeah, we're just gonna like all put our heads together and just come together, and that is just a recipe for disaster, you know, like that. That is just like one of those things that like it all sounds good in theory. But it rarely works out, especially if the guys don't know each other, because there's always going to be like, it's my idea. My idea is better. I have the better one. Right. So I think that's um, that's the main thing. So uh, I, like it can it could be chemistry wise. They could have some kind of like breakdowns and, and maybe not reach their potential because of it, but expect them to be better. I think I think that the thing that I'm monitoring is what's the deal with their offense. That's what I'm interested to see because they're just going to roll with Miller Moss. Now he had a great uh, he had a great bowl game, right? And he's a good story for sure, right? Like he stuck it out, uh, hung in there, and now he earned his time, right? So uh, good job by him on that. But like, you know, you're just. You're just using the bowl. Like, they, they were going to go into the portal. He has a good bowl game. It's like, all right, we're not going to go in the portal anymore. It's like, well, bowl games are kind of tricky, right? Like, you're, you're going against a Louisville team that is no longer, like, they're not that super motivated unit anymore. Um, and they, they had a bunch of guys sit out the bowl game, right? So it's just kind of like, I don't know, man. I, I, I wouldn't be I, – I, it just seems like a risk there. And so I'm kind of curious where that is. I've seen a lot of things on the on on Twitter, just like on the NFL draft, talking about how uh, Lincoln Riley's running like a Mickey Mouse offense, and they got like they're accounting for that in their evaluation of Caleb Williams. So 
I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of looking at that. And they question the re- question the receivers. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, yeah. and and the other thing is too is that um, listen, they've recruited well in terms of skill guys. Like Zachariah Branch is going to be a problem. Like yeah. he, he is going to be heavily featured this year. Like um, where he should be much more than a gadget guy. You know, and even as a gadget guy, he's a problem, right? So, mm-hmm. and then they have Deuce Robinson who should be a dude for them and Makai Lemon who was another like super speedy dude that they had a problem with but if you look at the rest of um their receivers nobody who was important for them came back like everybody's gone like uh Taj Washington and Brendan Rice um and Dorian Singer who was the, the transfer who kind of end up being a disappointment um they're gone right so it's I, I I don't know like I, I like not to say those guys could all those young guys could be amazing right but you just know not everyone's gonna hit because that's just how it goes they don't yeah. all hit and so um it's gonna be and I, I think it's gonna be interesting because um I wonder if they're gonna get another um maybe wide out in the portal. Um, they took, they took another kid, like a small school kid, Jaden Richardson, you know, put up numbers as previous school. Like he might be something, I mean, that could be something, but like, they don't have a, um, a Jordan Addison is the way to kind of put it. And like, um, and the old line has still got questions. The old line has still got questions. That's the main thing. Cause if you look at it last year, they couldn't block Notre Dame. They couldn't block Notre Dame, and that's the main thing. Caleb Booms is running for his life, and if he can't, uh, I mean, I he couldn't pull the Houdini stuff that he did the previous year, and I don't think Miller Moss is going to pull the Houdini stuff. So yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a lot to be determined there, aside from their defense. Uh, CHS or CHS FB seventy five biggest surprise so far. Uh, last time had. Notre Dame had this much depth. Um, biggest surprise. I, I think – I don't know that there's been, like, a ton of surprises. I, I think Jaden Harrison being something other than just a kick returner is probably a nice surprise for them. Uh, just I, I think they thought, oh, we, we have a guy who can return kickoffs, be a special teams kind of maven, uh, and I think he's going to be a real threat on the uh on the outside as a as a slot guy so i think that's one um can you think can you think of another one i think that's about it because there really hasn't been a surprise there hasn't been a guy that um you you said that like oh man this wasn't like i know you know this wasn't on my bingo card that this guy was going to kind of step up and um there hasn't been that young guy who kind of like jumped the line because i don't think there's any none of the linebackers that we're talking about right now in terms of the young linebackers are all guys that we thought could be in the mix and they are in the mix. Yeah. Right. And then even like, if you're talking about some of the early enrollees and you're, you know, and the guys who get more attention are KVA and Bryce young, they're the highest rated guys, whatever. Well, they're the guys who've showed up the most in terms of like where they've been. So I don't think there has been a real um, surprise in that way. Um, They're just, yeah, it just kind of hasn't worked out that way. It's I would just say that uh, so far, everybody that you kind of thought, hey, they need to take a jump, um, just about all those guys have been as advertised. And there hasn't been any in like surprises in a bad way either where you're like, oh, man, this guy's just not even close um, to being ready. Uh, so I, and, and there's still like the jury's still out with some guys. So um yeah, I I don't know. It's it's been there hasn't been that revelation, I guess, in in spring so far. I'm I'm surprised at the way people talk about CJ Carr's throwing ability. It's not a huge surprise, but I did not expect I did not expect to hear a ton about CJ Carr this spring. And and to be clear, we haven't heard a ton, but just the way that people talk about him, I did not I thought it would be more based on his uh his maturity uh his leadership um you know 
intangible stuff, not the physical. I did not expect that. So, um, and that's another good surprise. I, I think CFB Hurts brings Clarence Lewis. I think that's a pretty big surprise leaving. Yeah, that's that was probably, surpri- it was a surprising yeah. the middle of spring. Yeah. But it wouldn't have surprised me if he left at the end of spring, though. So, yeah. I, I mean, it's from that sense, it's like not crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'll say that I just, I'm not that surprised about CJ Carr just because I saw him throw yeah. in person, like right before he committed to Notre Dame. And I was like, the ball comes out of his hand different. Like, you just, and that was when he was yet a lot younger, too, right? Like, you could just see he just, has that kind of natural talent and uh that natural arm talent so yeah um and i guess with the the, the last time andy had this m- much depth um i don't know i mean it's tough to say because i okay since i've been covering the team uh for isd which is 2015 i think this is the deepest it's been in terms of like um, there's not a lot of like problem spots where like, oh man, this is a problem. Like one guy goes down here and they're in serious trouble or whatever. Like yeah. maybe the offensive line, because it's like a transition year there and they're like um, kind of working there. But even if you look at like the O line and it's not to say that this is all like, it's all going to work out or whatever, but like they've recruited well enough to the point where like, a lot of these guys are going to be able to play at least and not, mm-hmm. not like, and can kind of fill in. Um, so um, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say just backfield depth, tight end depth. Cause uh, you know, you look at kind of where their top three is at a tight end and that's a good top three to me. Um, they're, they're deeper at receiver this year than they've been. I'm certainly have been deeper in other years, but like, way more depth at receiver quarterback you know you like where they're at at quarterback with talent wise uh kind of across the board like uh i would say d-line i think they've had deeper years at certain spots but like maybe just in terms of like the second team being a little bit more higher quality but like they got guys who can play uh you know on the second team and backer you know there's a lot of young talent there um excited about the corners still and um you know and then the young guys they they have young guys that freshmen who can help them this year so it's a pretty good situation and and i I would say it's better than any other year that i've uh, covered the team i think there are some positions that are i mean dare i say loaded i'm not doesn't make people happy some people when i say loaded but uh (laughs) But I think, like you look at running back, like I think you could say that. I think I think just in terms of numbers uh, at wide receiver, right? Uh, that I think you could say that about them. Quarterback is clearly one, right? Um, I think I think linebacker is one, you know, and and I think D line is not one, like especially inside. I, I would say no to that, but maybe on the edges a little bit, right? Like there's that. Um, and I think Luke Talich and and Adon Schuler kind of moved the safeties into that spot too, because you know Xavier Watts and Rod Hurd can play. You know they can play. And now you've got two guys there. And then Ben Minnick is kind of lurking, right? So and then you've got, you know, Bronte Johnson's coming in. So we have we haven't seen him yet. So there's a lot there. Uh, I think it's a good point that there's just a lot of guys who it's like, yeah, if they played him, they'd be okay. And it's like second and third kind of on down the line and that's that's a good place to be in for Notre Dame uh Java asks if Snead can become a three down linebacker and not just use in sub packages how does that change the defense um do you think that changes the defense in any way other than uh just kind of the ceiling in terms of what they'll try to do defensively if Jalen Snead is kind of a main guy for them um I don't think it I don't think it like fundamentally changes the defense right. in terms of um in any kind of way like they're going to tweak all these things because of that. I so I'll just get that off the table but um yeah, I just think like athletically like 
they are just better. They become more athletic. Like that's just yeah. what it is. Like he is a guy who is fast and violent. And if he can play fast and play within the scheme and do that, it's just, it's the same thing as like, how does, uh, and I'm not saying he's going to be quite at this level, but it's just like, well, having Jerome, uh, Jer- Jerome, uh, Jeremiah Owosu Koromoa at Rover and adding his athleticism at Rover, even compared to when, say, Drew Tranquil played Rover, who's a pretty good athlete at, you know, in, in 2017. Well, the defense is different because of that athleticism, right? So um, I think that's, the way to just look at it is just like it adds to be like, well, he can make some plays. It's like uh, I was reading this thing on Twitter the other day and it was, I can't remember. So I apologize for uh, um, who put it up there, but they're talking about uh, Trevin Wallace, who's a linebacker from Kentucky who's in the draft this year. Okay. And basically they're talking about why you like, why you like to have speed at linebacker because you're never out of the play. You're never out of the play if you have speed, right? And that's the thing with Jalen Seed is that if if he is playing and he's doing everything at a high level, well, you're never out of the play because of that guy can run stuff down that some other guys can't, right? And that's just really what it comes down to. Yeah. Uh, here's a good question from Rajon, not specifically related to Jalen Seed, uh, but is there any aspect that you're hearing from camp that you are skeptical about? So is there any narrative out there uh, that you're just kind of like, ah, I'm, I'm need, I need to see more of that. All right. I'm, I'm not sure there. Um, well, I mean, I did hear that they, you know, from people around think that the defense is going to be like better than last year and maybe the best they've had in a long time. So, and I'm not saying that they won't be, or they're not, I just think they're going to be really, really good again and, and probably great, you know, just like they were, but I mean, I don't know. They were really good last year. So it's like getting to that level again, like, and, and, and kind of being better than that or like being better. So we're going to talk about this defense. That's better than the 2012, better than, um, you know, better than 2018, better than uh, 2019, better than, you know, last year's defense. Like that's a high standard, right? That's a very, very high standard. So if that's kind of where they're at, like that is the kind of thing that can raise them up uh, a level, right? So um, I I don't know if I'm – I guess I'm a little skeptical. Can, it can be that good because I just because just we haven't seen enough. I haven't seen yeah. that yet. You know, I haven't seen um, that in totality yet. But like, I guess it wouldn't. I I wouldn't be shocked by it though if it happened. So um, I don't know. Like, I I'm definitely excited about the defense, but just like to hear that it could be like I don't know. I guess that would be they would be like a top three defense or something like that. And if it's like gets to that point, it's like whoa, like. That is, um, that's something to get excited about. So I'm a little skeptical of that, but I mean, we'll see. I'm I'm skeptical of uh, the Jalen Sneed stuff specifically. Not have nothing. It has nothing to do with him. It's not that I don't believe it. It's just that it's based on things not seen, right? And I don't like based on things that are not seen. I like it to be like I saw him. Sh- uh, knife into the backfield and stop a play. You know, I I want I want it to be. It's like he read this play and a hundred miles an hour just defeated the block or beat the blocker and got into the backfield and made a play. Right, playing yeah. fast. And I think we all know what that kind of looks like. Right, uh, like basically the way Tavon Coney plays. You know, and I'm not saying he has to look like that. I'm just saying like things like that that we just haven't seen from him that often. I think we yeah. saw a play in the uh, in, in the bowl game where I thought was, you know, he read the reverse and uh, he, he, you know, was very assignment sound there. His eyes, he had really good eyes, uh, defeated that play basically by himself. 
I don't know that he made the actual tackle, but I think he kind of took up a blocker and set it up for someone else to make the tackle. So it's that, right? Like stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's like a ton of uh, like hyper, hyperbolic um, kind of juice around any specific aspect where I'm like, I don't know about that. Right? Like everyone's fairly reserved. Like even the praise of like someone like Micah Gilbert is just kind of like, yeah, he looks good. You know, no one's yeah. making a proclamation, but he looks fine. Right. Uh, and so I, I think it's been a pretty tempered, uh, pretty tempered spring from that aspect. So, um, but that's a good question from Rajon. I, I like, I yeah. like that. Uh, all right. Duke, Duke Sinatra was a, a bunch of questions here uh, and they're all very good. So we're going to, we're going to go with them. Uh, assuming he is the starting quarterback, how much would Riley Leonard have to improve as compared to how he played at Duke to make Notre Dame a legit title contender, how much better is it reasonable? I think Leonard will appear simply by playing in Denbrock's scheme and with better talent around him, even if he doesn't clean up his mechanics or other issues he had at Duke. So, uh, where where can where can Riley Leonard make a, an improvement based on just the offense that he's playing in, Jamie? Um. I think it's accuracy. Uh, I think that's the primary one for me. And it, and it's like the kind of like, um, and the deep ball because he didn't, well, they didn't ask him to throw the deep ball. It was a very conservative offense. Right. So, yeah. um, but from that perspective, you'd like to see the accuracy numbers be a little bit better. Right. So, and I think it just in general and some of that, yeah, is maybe mechanics or whatever. So accuracy, I think, is a big thing. Um, I, I don't think he's like a poor decision maker or anything. I actually think he's pretty good um, yeah. from that respect. So I think it's more of like, um, you know, can he succeed with just like a more aggressive scheme uh, in terms of throwing the ball Uh if he's just the same runner that he was, that's gold. Even if he's the same guy it, totally that he was, that's still going to, I mean, that's still uh, a very, very uh, good thing. But I just think he needs, he needs to grow as a passer in all respects, really, right? So he needs to prove that he can, like, you know, connect on the deep ball and really develop chemistry and be accurate with the deep ball. Um that he can, uh, you know, arm isn't isn't a problem with him. Like, but he needs to prove that he can be consistently accurate to the point that players are able to make plays after the catch because of ball placement and and those types of things. That's important. And I think so. He has to kind of jump up a level and be the guy that all of a sudden they're talking about him. You know, because before um, the season last year. I think Dane Brugler had him as like the 28th ranked prospect mm -hmm. heading into the season or whatever out of his top 50. He needs to get back in that conversation and that, mm -hmm. and kind of prove it with, and that was based on projection. So he needs to play that, that projection, that pro hit that projection of where they uh, like a guy like Dane Brugler thought he was going to be right. Mm -hmm. So if he gets to that point, that's how they jump up um, and become like a national title contender because Notre Dame really hasn't had a quarterback like that in, in, in quite a while. And the last time they did was like, you know, probably Kaiser playing at his very best. Yeah. They, so he, to your point about Duke's offense, like they really did not try to push the ball. And, and I think it was Luke Tolich who made the point where it's like every pass play is like someone is testing you vertically, you know? And and I think there and there's going to be multiple pass plays where multiple guys are testing the defense vertically, and that is where he needs to make the jump. It's like, man, you need to make big boy throws, like big boy stuff, where it's like, hey, man, I'm I'm taking a shot. I'm trying to fit this in. I'm, I'm trying to I'm I'm pushing the ball down the field. He didn't really do that at Duke, to your point. And so that's kind of where it is to me. It's like his biggest improvement. It's like, hey, man, like we, you know. We love your, the arm. We love how it looks. We love your body. We love your, uh, 
your your physical makeup. We love your running. We love all that stuff, right? But you actually have to go do make the throws, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing with Jaden Daniels, right? Like he went there and made the throws and made the plays, and that's why he made he's made the big jump that he has. And I, that's what Riley Leonard has to do, right? You just gotta you gotta make the throws, you know? There you're gonna have opportunities to do that, and so he need, he needs to go and uh, and do that. So uh that's that's his challenge uh uh the second question car is getting topic talked up a lot though maybe that's just because he's the new guy what is your best guess of how much uh, a gap there is between car and minchi at this point um I, I i would say i mean physically i don't know but minchi has to be a lot a lot more further along i car. think it's just it, it's just the thing with mentally right and that's yeah. the thing where it's going to be there just being it's just like how Angeli is there's that gap because he's had that he's just had more reps within the system. So now Minchie has had more reps than Carr. And that's just um kind of how it is. Um I couldn't even render how big that gap is. I don't know. Um, the one thing is that it can obviously close, right? Like that gap can obviously close, and we don't know um, you know, where where it's at um but i think that uh you're always getting to hype up the new guy right yeah. and and in a sense you're going to hype up minchi too over angeli right because even though angeli impressed last year there's always the people that who are always going to bring up well yeah but because he doesn't have certain things that you uh, want in terms of traits right he doesn't he doesn't have the just rocket arm right yeah. he doesn't have um you know if you even if you look at that oregon state game and when you're like man the guy completed like close to 80 percent of his passes and all that well the kind of toughest throws that could have would have been touchdown throws he missed so you could point to those things right so it's like um I think it's one of those kind of things where it's like, it's always a court when it comes to quarterback, there's always the shiny uh, new toy, unless it's some guy who's like certified dude, uh, you know, Trevor Lawrence, whatever. Right. Like, and so I think that is just, you know, going to tend to happen, but also just remember too, that like, I mean, CJ Carr was ranked like that for a reason, yeah. you know, on three ranking him like that was, dumb like it just he's a talented guy he's very very talented kid so it's not like at all surprising that he's like i i think almost he was committed to notre dame for so long that maybe some people kind of forgot that oh yeah this guy is he just he was ranked this high for so long at this time and kind of maintained it when you've seen other guys like buckner and uh uh Dracovic, for example yeah those guys have dropped and yeah. they obviously dropped for a reason. Yeah. And on three was out of pocket with that yeah. as well. I don't know. There's, they're just trying to make that. a, I don't know. Who knows what they're, there, what there's they're that. Just, uh, do you who knows think what Mullins, was. do you think Mullins is a long term uh, three tip? Uh, yes, I do. Um, yeah. And I'm not like shocked that he's end up there because if you just look at his body type, he looks like a guy who was going to put on a lot of weight anyways. Right. So, and then now that I've seen him in person, he's got big legs. Like he's, he's got his legs match the other defensive tackles legs is, is okay. what I would kind of say. And it's with him, it's adding, you know, upper body and getting bigger and adding mass and whatever. And like, he doesn't look like, I think he's listed at 244. But reminder that don't read into the listed weights for people yeah. too much. I would be shocked if he's in the 240s. He's he's he looks closer to 260 to me. So and I don't know if that he is, but that's what he looks like. Um, and if he's like, put it that way, if he if he's say he's 250 and he looks like he's you know 260 265 then that means he's going to keep uh, – he's got a lot more to give too, right? Like he's, he's going to get bigger and bigger. So um, I, I'm surprised that they moved him this early. Um, 
But also, too, I like it if that's where they see it because I just think putting someone who at not where you envision them being in the long run, do it right away so then they can do everything they need to approach physically where they need to be at because it would do no good to play if you were if they thought he came in and they were like, well, let's just give him you know, reps at edge and just whatever, just to keep him happy this spring. And, you know, we're going to end up moving him inside, but just like, don't worry about it. Well, then you're taking away the summer of him putting in all this time to add. And it's just like, you're wasting months of a guy's time really to do that. Um, And I just think that's just, and, and wasting months, wasting reps. So like, for instance, he's was, you know, when he's repping with the defensive tackles, and they were working on uh, a drill where it was like, you know, base base block versus reach block. You know, you're recognizing things, and you got to do your footwork, and you got to like fight cer- fight certain pressure on certain blocks, right? Well, that look is different as a three tech than it is if as you are end. outside, right? Yeah. So if he's learning all this stuff from outside, and then having to move in, and then it's like. Well, now you're starting back from scratch again. It just doesn't do him any good. So um, I'm surprised that he's there already, but I think it's good. Like, I think it's good if that's where they view him. I don't know what it says about um, the other defensive tackles too. Maybe partially it's because they're like, well, Mookum is out too. So we want to like give some some more reps here too. Plus if like, if he's good there, he's good there. Right. And it other, other people, it just, it is what it is. Like you have to, you have to rep the guys at the same spot. If we hear about him moving out to the end again, I'm, I'm gonna be upset. We've talked about this a ton with these guys. It's like you gotta get them in and get their spot and let them learn their position instead of going back and forth. Um, that's that's frustrating. And it's good that like I, I think it's good that you have a guy who it's like he has the skill set of an outside player and he moves inside. Um, because then you know there's a certain amount of athleticism that goes along with that, right? Um, and, and the way that they move around. So I think that would be a good thing. Um, why hasn't, I'll, I'll just condense this question a little bit. Why hasn't Notre Dame kind of focused on kind of the bigger D tackles, kind of the Sean Sevillanos of, of the world in the 2025 class? Um, personally, I think it's just, there aren't a lot of guys like that. And so it's hard to get in on them. And remember that Notre Dame, they got on Sean Sevillano kind of late in the process. Um, he mentions the Georgia, the Georgia kid, like he was late in the process, right? Like there just aren't that many people or there aren't that many players who fit that profile. Right. And that's why they're kind of so highly coveted. It's got, Cause there's just, they're just not in big numbers, but what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. Um, there's not a ton of those guys out there. That's just a fact. I also don't think it's like a great year at defensive tackle in general. And I would say it's the last you know, couple classes, uh, um, offensive tackle, defensive tackle haven't been the strongest. So um, I think that's that's something to do with it. And also, too, like a majority of the guys that have that, who are already these monsters, are from the South. And they're from the South, and they're guys that um, – whether or not like academically it might be hard for them to get into Notre Dame or uh, it also might be that they have just zero interest in going mm-hmm. to Notre Dame and they're only interested in SEC schools and that's just a problem, right? And the thing is, if you look at it and you're like, man, Georgia's getting all these guys. Well, no one really else. And I know I understand like there's some other big boys in the SEC, but it's kind of like just Georgia and Alabama, like, like gobbling those yeah. guys up. And then there's a f- you know few guys slip through the cracks here and there, but there's not a lot of ton of other guys there, right? Like, and I would say even like if you look at say um, Michigan's DTs who were big guys last year, right? Like, I don't want to call it a fluke that it happened, but it's like they got one kid from Indiana and you know one kid from. Uh, um, you know, California, Southern California 
first of all, how many, I mean, Greg, you know, there's not a ton of those dudes in California. Not a lot. There's not a lot. And most of them, if they are, are Polynesian kids. Yeah. Right. That uh, are guys that, and those are guys that the, the old PAC 12 were all over. And that's a lot of the reasons why a lot of those, uh, they like to, I mean, they just like to stay out West for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is because, you know, their families want to see them play and stuff. And like they don't, and I mean, probably weather and all that too. Right. And so there's, (laughs) there's a lot of that. So, um, there's not a ton of, uh, those kids around. It's just like, how many kids from the Midwest do you see every year who are built like that? They're just not Mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, it's just hard to find them. It's hard to find them, even harder to land them. And that's just kind of a reality. Um, and a lot of it has to do with like, cause even like Riley Mills, I mean, obviously he's a monster, but like, he wasn't viewed in the same way of like, well, he's going to be this 300 pound three tech. Like, yeah that wasn't the thing that people were talking about with him right away. I thought like, I mean, I thought he was probably going to be a defensive tackle eventually, but it wasn't like, that wasn't like the big thing. No one was talking about, man, he's going to be this big freak of nature or whatever. It wasn't, that wasn't the talk with him at that time. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's just, and, and even then how many other kids from Illinois are, have been built like him? Just not a lot. It's, it's tough. It's tough to find him. Yep. Uh, last question from Duke Sinatra. Uh, how would you compare to new kinds and tail and Taylor in terms of talent and future impact in college? Uh, do you prefer one over the other? Um, but so to new kinds, I- I'm interested to get your, I-, I-, I texted you and Matt this yesterday, and I- I'm curious what you think about his, uh, his long speed, his just overall speed. I checked out his track times. And the, I, I think they're legit, right? Like I, I, I have a thing about track times and I look at them sometimes and I just kind of think like someone will have like a real fast time. And then I go look at their progression of times. I'm like, man, that one's kind of like, oh, there's a 10, five, five. And then there's a 10, nine and then a 10, nine. And then, a, and then a, another, a, you know, kind of high 10, eight kind of thing. It's like, I, I don't know what that 10, five, five is, but this one looks like, no, to new kinds is, has had four times that are either low 10 6 or mid 10 5 right he's got a 21 3 and a 21 4 200 these times this, that's how fast he is right i when i watched him i didn't see a guy who i thought was that fast it's just i just didn't see that and i'm wondering if you do because if he is that fast then i'm probably just going to always um defer to that speed so I, i'm curious what you what you think about that when you were evaluating him no i would say that if i was just looking at the film i would say talent taylor looks like he's got more explosive burst to yeah me, right yeah. if i'm just comparing the film and just looking at them on film uh in saying that i like to know so i do like yeah. him and i actually think he's like he is can be a deep threat and he's got he's just got kind of smooth qualities about him in terms of like um getting in and out of his breaks. I mean, he's skinny, so he does have that that kind of tr- track thing too. He, tr- mm-hmm. he tracks the football well in the air. Yeah. I think yeah. he's a good route runner. He's got some savvy and he can win contested. Like I like him as a player, and he is far more polished than Taylor Taylor. Taylor Taylor is very raw, like because of what they do to they ask him to do. He's kind of more of like a big athlete. Like, I think there's going to be, I mean, I certainly think you, if you're Notre Dame, you could take him, but like, he is not a guy that I would expect to play early, early, like, man, he's going to come in here and Micah Gilbert it in a, in a spring yeah. ball. He's going to, they might be like, wow, this guy's an athlete, but you're like, man, he's got a lot to learn, you know? So I would put him almost in like the Braylon James where you're like, this guy's got, he's got some work to do right to in 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 that sense um i don't know i, I think i would prefer to no kinds uh just in terms of uh polish but just ceiling i think taylor's got a higher ceiling yeah that's 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 why i'm i'm wondering about these times because if you can run 10 5 
at the junior, you know, it's a pretty high ceiling you can, you can end up with, right? So I, I don't know, but I do think that like as far as just with the ball in his hands too, I think Taylor Taylor is kind of he's really good in that aspect. Um I, I, I honestly I, I don't have like a huge preference um here. I I if they if they end up with either one of them, I, I would be fine with that. I think that's a good take for them, and I think it would be a good addition to the twenty five class. Um, that's kind of my t- some guys are just like I, I I don't I don't think there's just enough of a difference to really to really have a strong opinion about, and I think these two are in that front. I think they're both kind of of the same caliber, and I think they would both be really good additions to Notre Dame class. So. Thank you to Duke Sinatra for all those questions. Uh, Drew Brennan, famously of the, uh, would you rather have the Michigan defense or the, or the uh, Notre what Dame defense? What a question, defense? Drew. <laughs> um, is is Meadows out? Uh, Rajon, quickly on the receivers, is uh, Meadows out? No, he is not. He is no, not he's not. Out. He's very much a factor uh, that needs to be considered. So uh, watch that space. Um, all right, Drew Brennan needs to redeem himself from the Notre Dame defense versus Michigan defense question. Uh, <coughs> the importance of Jack Kaiser. Uh, will he be for the Army and Navy games this year as option teams? Uh, do you think he'll be a captain? I think he is a lock to be a captain on this football team with uh, with Xavier Watts and Howard Cross. That is my take. Uh, what, what do you think, Jamie? I mean, I, I – I would be surprised if he wasn't a captain just because of not just uh, his work on defense and just kind of him being like kind of the elder statesman at linebacker, mm-hmm. but because of his work on special teams and stuff like that. Like he's yeah. a guy who just, he's always been a guy who just like does all these different things for the team. Right. Like, um, you know, he played over 200 snaps on special teams last year. So like, he's a guy who's valuable. In a, mm. in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I always think it's, I always think it's valuable to have a guy who has played uh, against, you know, Navy, um, you know, you've played against a triple option in it's, it's an advantage, right? It, it's, it's an advantage, but in saying that, like, you know, JD Bertrand played, um, you know, against them, you know, multiple years. And I thought like JD Bertrand, maybe his kind of like worst game of the year was Davey. Like he didn't have like this unbelievable game um, that day. I think he missed like more tackles that day than he did the whole rest of the season. Um, So I don't know. Like, it's just one of these things. It's like, it's valuable, but I wouldn't put like Kaiser as, you know, because there's going to be different things that they do, and you always switch what you're doing and how you're approaching it. And then, our, first of all, uh, I I don't know if you know this, Drew, but Army doesn't run that like traditional uh, triple option anymore. They uh, pivoted; they're more of a spread team now. They they mm-hmm. were just basically like decided like they didn't want to kind of be in that same sense. I think they still do some stuff, but not. I know because that was like a big uh, topic last yeah. offseason as they were kind of pivoting out of that. So in so the Army game, not really. But just I think for the Navy game, it helps for sure. Um, I think it's more helpful for Ashley for even the defensive linemen mm-hmm. uh, because playing the cut is like something that is different. And now with the linebackers, you know, they, they can't cut you the same way and especially those outside guys they can't cut you the same way so it's just uh a little bit uh different so I, it's valuable but I, I don't think it's the be all end all yeah valuable something a good thing to have in the back pocket um something to have in your bag as as the kids like to say um and if you want to add things to your bag for your website or your social media page and you can go to vsrmediacompany.com just founded by Notre Dame football pregame host and Emmy award-winning anchor, Vahid Saad Razade. VSR Media provides professional and cinematic video and photo. Whether you're looking for a collegiate or pro-level highlight reel, have a personal story to tell, or are aiming to diversify and grow your business, VSR Media specializes in short and long-form video storytelling. 
social media management and website design. VSR Media also captures professional headshots, senior and sports photos. Contact them at vsrmediacompany.com. Mention Iris Sports Daily to receive 20% off your first project. Visit them online or give them a call at 574-800-9106. Next question from XRND 1994. Uh, any surprises, good or bad, for spring so far? I think we kind of covered this, Jamie. We went over uh, Jane Harrison, went over Mikey Gilbert a little bit, went over CJ Carr, um, and I think you know we we basically covered this one. So I think yeah. uh, I think that's good. Thank you for the you question, though, X or ND. Oh, go, I would just go. say that uh, we prob probably not giving enough credit to the Gilbert being a surprise is would be the one thing because I don't think anyone was like Micah Gilbert. Like, uh, Mike Gilbert's definitely going to play this year. Like, I frankly didn't see it. So, I thought he was going to be a good player eventually, but I didn't see that he was going to play this year. So, yeah, I, I, I think I, I think that one though is is we'll see. Even on that, right? He, yeah, I just mean he's not going to redshirt. Like he's going to play. Like yeah, I don't know how much. Yeah. I don't know how much of he's going to how much of a big impact he's going to make, but he's going to play. Okay. All right. Uh, next question from Vamos Irish. Here we Here go we from go. Oscar. <laughs> um, spring ball. Uh, I'll skip that part. Uh, spring ball ends in April, right before. Oh, I need to blow this up so I can read it properly. Before, uh, before, before Beltane, the Celtic celebration of life and what is to come. Gifts are made to the fairies for good fortune. Mike Frank made a rather generous offer offering this year. And the Celtic fairies have granted each of you a blessing. Your blessing is either one of production, one of strength, or one of cunning. Which blessing do you choose, and do you grant it? Who do you grant it to on the roster for the 2024 season? Um, I choose, I choose production because I need to, we need to be producing. I, I, I think that's the one for us is we need to be producing the shows. We need to be producing the content for the people. Um, you know, we're I'm, Dimes with Dara is going to come out with it. We're going to get our own podcast feed for that. So be on the lookout for that. Watch that space. Uh, Joyce lot. It's going to be big. We've got a lot of big plans there. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going with. What, what about you, Jamie? Um, I, I would say production. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I'll, who I'm going to grant it to um, on the current roster is – I'm going to grant it to um, – hmm. I'm going to grant it to Adon Schuler. Oh. Because I'm really excited about well, – He doesn't potential. need strength, I'll tell you that. No. I'm really <laughs> excited about his potential. I know he's going to play this year. Uh, he's going to – you know, he's going to be – if he's – I, I don't know if he'll be the starter, but like he's going to play. Uh, but I want to see him get his hands on the football. I want to see him produce. I want to see him make plays. So um, there you go. That's my guy. Uh, production. I'm going to give it to. Uh, I, I'm, I'll give it to Riley Leonard. I mean, look at I. I said he was gonna. I said he was gonna rush for a thousand yards, right? Like I need to. I need that to hit. Right. My 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 reputation is on the line, Jamie. So I, I would definitely get that to uh, give it to Ryan Leonard, the quarterback. I think it would be really good. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're going with. Thank you, Oscar, for that wonderful question. Uh, Trevor McKee uh, was looking at the average rating for our on 247 for Notre Dame. Notre Dame currently has the 17th best class per average recruit. Uh, so that's a rating. Right, so the average rating uh, per recruit, I think they're at ninety point three, which is below what ninety point uh, five four. I just ninety point five four. Excuse me, uh, yeah. which is below what it's been under Freeman. Usually, it's in the ninety ones, um, which might feel like not a big difference, but it kind of is actually uh, a, a whole point, a point and a half, or whatever it may be. Um, that actually is a pretty big difference in terms of uh, recruiting rating. Um, the national, he says, he's noticed the national guys seem to be okay with it. Um, I, I am also personally okay with it um, as it stands right now. Um, I'm wondering where you fall on that. Um, 
Well, one, it's going to go up because that's why I'm okay with it at the moment. Yeah. Well, basically all of the guys that they're in on now are like, it'll go up based on if they, if they land them. Right. So unless they strike out on like a bunch of these guys, which I don't think is going to happen, um, that rating will go up. So there's that part of it. There's also the part where, um, like, I don't know what it is, but uh, two four seven really has not liked a lot of uh, Notre Dame recruits in the last, like them personally. Uh, they haven't liked uh, a lot of Notre Dame recruits that others have. They've have like they've made a lot of guys three stars that are four stars on other services. Um, in this cycle and the last cycle, so I don't know if those guys are going to go up, but like, certainly I think there's going to be guys who move up too. like, that'll happen. So I think from that perspective, it'll go up. And then the other thing is that some of these other teams are going to go down, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is, that's going to happen because Notre Dame has way more commits than anybody else. Yeah. Right. Um, they have like, you know, they have 19. I think the next highest is like 11 or something, right? Like it's, it's, it's quite a big difference. So it's going to kind of even out. Notre Dame will go up. Others will kind of come back down. Um, my guess it's going to be around the same. Like I, there's definitely going to be some guys in this class. Cause I mean, that's how I have it rated too, that I don't think are going to be like rated super high and that's going to bring it down. And they've c- kind of, but Notre Dame loves them. They really like those yeah. guys. Also, too, like whatever. And I'm not. I don't want to speculate. Whatever. But are all these guys going to stay with Notre Dame in this class? I don't know. Like it's, yeah. you know, in terms of some of the lower rated guys, right? Yeah, we've certainly seen it before, right? We saw in the last class, right, with like um, Cedric Irvin, and. Uh, you know, or was that or was the previous one before that? The 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 previous one before that, and then like I mean, Owen Waffle, Waffle. Owen yeah. Waffle, right? So like, just it's you know, keep it peeled. It's early. You know, it always happens. I, yeah. The story of the twenty five class is yet to be written in terms of overall big picture stuff. They they're do they land Meadows? Do they land Zachary? Do they land Dallas Golden? Please land Dallas Golden. Right. Uh, do any of these do do they land to new kinds? Right. Uh, the, the, you know, these are all these are highly rated prospects. Um, do they land Tristan Haynes, who is visiting this weekend? Right. Uh, do they land uh, Josh Petty, who's visiting this weekend? Like like there's so many things to be determined on the 25 class. I'm not worried about or I'm not concerned about where they stand as far as recruiting rankings at the moment. Right. There's like you said, there's going to be a lot of moves. Right. So. Uh, not the biggest uh, concern at the moment. Good question, though, uh, from Trevor. Curious, uh, curious say Irish. Uh, assuming Leonard is named starter, uh, who transfers out, Minji or Angeli? Just can't see both sticking around with Carr already on campus. Hopefully Deuce in the fold. Um, I have no idea. This is just one of those things, and I understand why someone asked it, but it's just like – it's just one of those things. It's like impossible to answer and almost irresponsible to answer. So no, no, whatever, no shots sh- at the question. Cause I understand it's like something that every Notre Dame fan's thinking about. Cause not all these guys are going to finish at Notre Dame. That's just how it is. Right. Yeah. Like it, it never happens that way. So yeah, one of those guys, maybe, maybe both or whatever, maybe car, like you, we don't know, right? Like things are going to happen. That's because quarterbacks, there's only one quarterback can go play. And very rarely does the guy, um, so Garrett Nussmeyer, who stuck around at LSU, like he's the exception. Like that doesn't happen very often. So I, I just think it's one of those things where you're going to have to wait and see. I will say that I would be surprised if any of these guys transfer after the spring. So I wouldn't. Uh, I, I I would expect all these guys to be on the team uh, this season. So, and then I'm sure as, you know, they figure out who the two 2025 quarterback's going to be 
and I, I am almost certain they're not going to take a transfer there. Yeah. Uh, that they will. Um, yeah. I mean, one or two guys will leave. That's just how it is. Yeah. I, I, I think they'll stay. It makes more it, just to me. It makes more sense to stick around to see who the 25 quarterback is. It, you, yeah. you made the perfect point uh, because that job's going to be open. And, and Marcus Freeman has stated he doesn't want to do the portal again. Right. And so it makes like, just fight for that job. You know, I could, because I think whoever that is, whoever doesn't get that, whoever doesn't win the job or doesn't look like they're going to win the job or whatever it may be, then you can go on somewhere and better situation for them specifically. I, I just don't think it now is a good time. Now, you know, if if I was to sit around not on a public uh, show, because we do have to be careful, we can't just spitball on this show about topics like this, because I've I've not recently, but like I've spitballed on things before, and then I get a text message like, "Hey, did you say this on the thing?" It's like, uh, I mean, I did, but not really, and it's like, well, it's being mentioned that you said this on the thing, and then it's like, okay. I, I, you just got to be careful about stuff when, especially when it comes to transfers. Like I can make a case for all of them to stay. I can make a case for all of them to leave. Right. Yeah. I have no idea how they feel about it. I have no idea what kind of conversations they're having with, with the coaches, with their family, whatever it may be. So, yeah. And I, I think just the one thing to remember with it is. O- only. Things only get going faster in terms of guys transferring is if they decide and they like the coaches tell them and the, it, and reps start to reflect it. Where say like if Minchie jumps Angeli to be the backup, if Carr jumped uh, Minchie to be the yeah. number three, like if that kind of stuff happens, well then someone would leave, right? Yeah, but until that kind of thing happens, it's too irresponsible for us to just be like, I'm going to say this guy. Like he just can't, yeah. like I just, yeah, I, you know, and it, and, and it's totally unfair to them and just saying like, cause we haven't seen enough of it to, to, yeah. to know. Um, I mean, other than Angeli where we're like, yeah, he can play, you know, we haven't seen enough from Minchi or Carr to just say like, yeah, this is how it's going to go down. This is how it's going to break down. Yeah, yeah. All right, next question uh, from BVZ. Could you please outline the ideal characteristics that the de- defensive staff is looking for at the nickel position? So, Jamie, I think that, number one, there is a minimum athleticism component to this. And I think that is why um, Clarence Lewis could never really take hold of the spot. It's because I don't think he fit the athletic profile, what they're looking for, right? Thomas Harper is a, a sub four five guy. And I don't think that's true of Clarence Lewis. You do need to be able to run. Sean Crawford was a sub four or five guy. And you have to be able to chase guys. Slot fade is one of the biggest routes uh, in college football right now. Yeah. And you have to be able to stay in the hip stay in the face of the receiver. You have to be able to stay connected there when they're running away from it. If you can't, you can't really play the can't play. Can't play. You have to be able to, um, you have to be able to chase all over the field because of the nature of the position and where you are. Um, You have to have uh, fluid hips. You have to be able to turn your hips. You have to be able to even more so than you would at corner, right? You have to be able to play both ways. You have to be able to turn both ways. Um, you have to be an aggressive player. You have to be aggressive minded. They send you on blitz all the time. You cannot be afraid to stick your face in there on an offensive lineman, be it a run fit or a blitz. Um, you know, obviously I don't think you need to be smaller, but I think that position just kind of lends itself based on the athleticism component, the the hip turn component, things of that nature. Uh, what do you say, what say you, Jamie? Uh, you know what? I think you really covered it well. The only thing I'll add is people should go back and listen to Greg's podcast that he did with Sean Crawford. Uh, the first one that he did, because we did another one yeah. where we both talked to him and that was a very good one too. But 
specifically Greg talked to him about the nickel position and he really gave a great answer talking about the traits for it and all the kind of responsibilities there. And I think people would really, that would BVZ. That is my recommendation to you. Go back, go look in H and H uh, the, you know, you can find it on the, on YouTube, you can find it on Spotify, uh, Apple, wherever, and find that episode with Crawford and um where he talks about it because he gives a great great answer um and him and gray have a great discussion on it and by the way micah bell checks a lot of boxes the only thing that i'm worried about with him is hip fluidity can he can he turn the hips uh well enough in the slot to uh to really be like a top line guy there but all the other boxes like he checks them so yeah we talk about him uh, Michael Bell a lot in that episode, so I, I recommend everyone check it out. Just search out Sean Crawford ISD. You'll find it on uh, on the YouTube. Uh, okay, last question of the day. Funk Beavis coming after Canada. I'm actually I'm I, I didn't know this, so I, it's interesting. I just learned that Zach Eady wasn't allowed to make money off nil deals in the U.S. because he's here on a student visa. With Notre Dame starting to form a Canadian pipeline. Would Jamie be willing to run the Canadian fund to give our Canadian players NIL opportunities back home? Uh, the last part of that is in jest, but is it true that that Notre Dame's Canadian players are – I mean, I, I think a lot of them are born okay. in Canada and then have since moved. I, I'm curious about what this actually is. I got to tell you, I, this was reported, and I think it was like front office sports – did or, some, or someone did it or whatever. I don't know. But they yeah. asked him about it, and they said he didn't do it. I think Purdue might have been screwing Zach Eady there or something, or there's something else there because – um, so because I, I mentioned this to my wife, and I was like, wow, this is – because there's obviously – there's a lot of Canadians playing Division One sports in yeah. um, the U.S., and I'm like – that is not okay. So I know Michael Hahn is saying this. I don't believe this is true because my wife is, you know, I've mentioned that she works with uh, beach volleyball athletes in Canada. Well, many of them played beach volleyball in the NCAA and they made money off of NIL. Like yeah. they, they were able to get sponsorships. Like, um, Specifically, like there was uh, these girls who played at UCLA who like got a lot of money, like they did well. So I don't know if they found some kind of workaround for it or if there's something else that's going on. I'm going to guess that it's like, well, one, I don't think Zach Eady is probably too motivated by the NIL, even though he could have been for being a guy who's two time national player of the year. Um, also, too, it had been hilarious. I just would what, – what, who sponsored him? I just want to know. That would be a mm. great – I think there could be some really funny uh, ads there. Um, I don't – I don't know. I, I don't I don't believe that it, it's as black and white as, as, as Edie kind of put it and how it was portrayed. I don't, I don't believe that's the case because there's a lot of um, – like – I want to know, like, Aaliyah Edwards is for UConn, you know, uh, one of their frontline players. Yeah. I think she made some cash. I'm going to guess she made some cash while she was there. And, uh, you know, Rachel said the hockey players that are down there. There's yeah. Some of these guys are like, you know, there's one guy right now, I, Aiden Celebrini, is going to be the number one pick in the draft. Like, I'm sure he's getting something. Or yeah. he's getting something from Canada or whatever. Like, there's got to be some kind of workaround for it that Edie didn't take advantage of. Um, I don't know. So or I, he I, did, and he doesn't want to just he doesn't want to. Or talk he doesn't want to talk it. about whatever. Yeah. I don't. I you know I don't know the total specifics of it, but I remember because I was like, wow, like that would seem like a really big deal, especially for a guy like Edie who's a big thing. And my wife was like. Yeah, that's not true because, like, unless, you know, these women were getting money that they shouldn't have been getting or whatever, it's like, no, they were doing it and they had deals. And so, I don't know. 
yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the full answer, but I don't think it's as cut and dry as that. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, it, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure someone's found yeah. a way. In other words, I'm not starting the Canadian fund there. <laughs> no. It's not starting the fund. Yeah. All right. That's good stuff. All right. We're going to end it there. Those are all the questions. Thank you everyone for your contributions. If you haven't done so, please hit the like on this video, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. So whenever it is, we are going live. We may be doing a live show this weekend. Stay tuned. Watch this space. We will we will check it out. Uh, there there might be a, a, a practice viewing that comes up that we are going to discuss. So you're going to want to stay tuned in to Irish Sports Daily YouTube channel. Uh, everyone, have a good rest of your day. Enjoy the Masters if you're into that sort of thing. We'll talk to you soon. Keep hitting 